How's it going, everybody? My name is Antonio, and um, you, for some reason, are still not subscribed to the CEO Barbecue channel, despite me practically begging for it every other week when I come on here. And uh, there's literally only 550 people on there right now, which is an absolute shame, given that um, I now have about two to three interviews lined up uh, every week. And those are real interviews, you know, which are very much needed in our uh, obscure sector, obviously. But yeah, I mean, if you're if you're interested in figuring out uh, what's going on with some of these companies, and if you want to hear about new companies on the weekly, again, two to three companies a week, yeah, please feel free to come and join me on that channel. Um, I'll, I'll probably leave a link somewhere below. But you are, however, for some reason, about to waste your Sunday watching episode 77 of Resource Heads, the only news regurgitating show on the internet that is led by a ginger, which is, well, this is a significant and a very fundamental fact. See, I, I can say fundamental without saying fundamentals. No reason to get angry with me. This episode covers the trading week of July 31st to August 4, which was the 31st week of the year, which is, by the way, the same week in which uh, 52 years ago MTV was first launched and it ruined the world since, which is actually a little bit amusing considering the first song to play on MTV was Video Killed the Radio Star, which in retrospect is a pretty good predictive song they don't they don't make them like that anymore do they now what else happened this week is actually a lot so i'm not going to be doing this one alone um i have andrew chubb who's a geologist who's uh, worked in niger he's worked in mali he's worked in um, guinea he's uh, lived in burkina faso and he currently works in uh, cote d'ivoire so i have him on to talk to me about what's happening with the uh, with well, in Niger, but not only, just generally in the Sahel Belt, where is this Where is this whole thing going and what does it mean for mining and exploration companies? Uh, what are we supposed to do and so on and so forth? And then I have Luke Denhaven on to talk to me about two potentially significant discoveries that happened this week uh, in the junior mining space, as well as a couple of other things, a couple of other interesting news uh, that are stirring the um, the melting pot of the junior market. And of course, I'll be ranting away. I'll be ranting about uh, what am I going to be? I'm going to be talking about copper. I'm going to be talking about uranium, lithium, maybe a little bit of gold. We'll see. Uh, but before that, I'll get my rant out about China. And then I'll start talking about these things. Oh, I'll talk about copper, uh, about tin as well. Excuse me, tin. Uh, interesting thing that got confirmed this week in tin as well. Um, because I also have a new uh, Department of Energy report that says and, and get this, it says that lithium and nickel are more important to the energy sector and at a higher risk of supply shortage than uranium and copper. So if you want to see me get unreasonably angry, well then, yeah, keep wasting your Sunday on watching this video because gingers don't have souls, which means that I don't get angry. So you're not going to see that in this video. But let's cut that. Let's go to China. Uh, the theme in China remains, the conclusion basically for China remains not as good as expected. That's pretty much it. Now you can skip this whole thing and, and not listen to me rant about China. But PMI data, data came in this week, resulting in another drop in the Chinese composite PMI. This is the third one in a row, uh, and it fell to about 51. So this is not yet indicating contraction technically in the activity of the purchasing managers in China. But I, I cannot just sit here and tell you with a straight face that it's good news either. Uh, the drop in the composite PMI is also mainly driven by uh, yet another drop in the non-manufacturing PMI, which was the thing that really held it up. Um, and it has also been the non-manufacturing PMI has been dropping since March of this year, and it has now reached the level of 51 and a half. Again, technically expansion in the purchasing activity of the non-manufacturing sector in this case, but a dropping non-M PMI is the... Um, the, the, well, that's not normal. This is out of the ordinary because we usually see purchasing activity in the services sector speed up in the spring, in the summer. And it's in China, it's done the opposite this time around. Not only in China, but anyways, the manufacturing PMI in China came in pretty much as expected, came in at uh, 49.3, which indicates that the manufacturing sector is still being cautious. It's not ramping up purchasing activities. Um, and it's also in decline since March of this year as well. So it is no surprise that finally the Shai Chin manufacturing PMI, which is kind of like the previous PMI that I covered, but it covers smaller companies. Well, that index has now also dipped below 50, and it's also on a clear downtrend again since March of this year. It's especially not a surprise given that the construction sector in China has been slowing down quite a lot, or at least activities in the construction sector. Um, have been slowing down. And and then the construction PMI, why I'm saying this is because the construction PMI fell from 65.6, .6, 
which is very good. 65.6 is a very good thing. Uh, that indicates a very high growth in the purchasing activities. But it fell from that to now 51.2 in a matter of a couple of um couple of weeks, really. So However, yeah, the, the Shai Chin Services PMI, though, um, is, uh, well, it is lower than March this year. It is still managed, though, to stay in expansion. It is still in expansion right now, and it even came above expectations this week, though. I mean, uh, I oftentimes come above, expect above the expectations of my wife as well, but that doesn't really say much because the, pretty much the whole deal when we, when we met each other was that she is to keep her expectations low if she's to have a happy life with me. All in all, what um, all of these numbers mean for China, not my marriage, and specifically the fact that we saw a spike going out of the lockdowns in those PMIs to now continually falling numbers, is that aliens are real. But it also means that managers in China are not seeing the recovery they might have expected five months ago. So they're scaling back their purchasing activities. Again, though, no worries, right? The central planner is there to, to save you and base your currency because these numbers are surely pulling Beijing's attention and pretty much all throughout the week when a government official was said to talk which is all they really do they said that a stimulus is coming but you know I haven't seen anything yet I haven't seen anything specific yet any documents anything like that and nothing that I can hang my hat on um and that's also what the market says actually it's actually saying that it it just doesn't trust Beijing yet the metals are largely down this week so the market's opinion though is 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 by the way not stopping China from doing what it's doing which is pretty much exactly what we are too busy to do because we're talking about climate change and which of course is securing the supply of critical metals so we're too busy doing that China's doing that instead of us I found this article on mining.com saying that new research data shows that China's metals and mining investments overseas are on track to hit record levels this year. What do you think of my uh, late night FM DJ voice? I heard it on an advertisement somebody said I'm trying it out. But more specifically, investments in new contracts in the metal and mining space in China uh, or out of China actually really have been over $10 billion in 2023. Alone. So in 2023, it's, this is actually only during the first half of 2023. And that's an over doubling 131% growth on a year on year basis. And with those $10 billion that um, China has already su surpassed in investments, uh, last year's full number was actually at a mere $7 billion. And I say mere, of course, in quote unquote. So last year, China spent, for the full year, they spent $7 billion on uh, metals and mining, and now they're spending $10 billion on it in the first half of 2023 alone. So if they keep investing like they have, this might this might end up being an all-time high in their investments, and it might reach $20 billion um, this year, almost 20% above the, the last high, which was in 2018, at $17 billion. Of course, it's not right to annualize in most cases, so I'm not sure that's exactly what's going to happen, but I'm just seeing what would happen. And what caught my eye is that uranium made the list as one of the six main metals that the Chinese are putting money in right now, with the other five being nickel, which is um, nickel actually saw the largest influx of capital in H1 of 2023. Lithium came at number two, copper came at number three, steel at number four, and iron ore. Uh, oh, well, it actually came behind uranium. So it is, uh, well, I guess technically at number six. The investments are spread all across the southern hemisphere um, of, of the planet, with the majority of money going into, well, of course, Indonesia and its nickel, as well as copper sectors. And of course, a bunch of money is going into Africa, Namibia specifically, when it comes down to uranium, of course, and, and some other countries. And also some money is uh, going into Bolivia for lithium, but also quite the pretty penny went into the steel, copper and iron sectors of, get this, Saudi Arabia. And uh, thanks to Christopher Nettopil, by the way, for gathering this data. Uh, now, what, talking about Saudi Arabia, by the way, this is an important one. This report that Christopher has, Christopher has put together here, uh, this report comes out one week after Saudi Arabia put $2.6 billion into Valet last week, buying a 13% stake in the miner. And this uh, Valet, you might know the company, they produce a lot of very important commodities. So copper, coal, cobalt, and other metals that don't start with the letter C. So this is just a start. This is, um, well, I guess you can ask it as a question, right? Is this just the start? Is this just the blow that sort of opens the door? And uh, is the majority of the cash out of Saudi Arabia to come into the space? Well, that's a difficult, yes. No, that's exactly what's happening. That's exactly what's happening. And I, I cannot say how much of a rival Saudi Arabia will be for China. But the West definitely cannot measure up against either one of them.
will not measure up. Well, I guess we technically could, but communism is, of course, more important. So while Saudi Arabia is talking to Beric about potentially building a huge copper mine in Pakistan and stealing away our best football, not the absolute best football players, they still haven't gotten messy. But in the meanwhile, as they are doing all these important things, we are at least talking about how to decarbonize CBDCs. I mean, what can go wrong here, really? Just think about it. If you're on Twitter and you follow Robert Friedland, which, by the way, you should, you'll also understand that this is not a today or yesterday type of thing. This is a tomorrow type of thing, but more like tomorrow and next 20 years type of thing. Because uh, Robert's personal net, well, you don't specifically know his network, but his his growing network and, and relationships in Saudi Arabia based on, based on the appearances that he makes on conferences and the pictures that he takes... Well, that network, for me at least, closely resembles the one that he built with China before he started operating one of the world's um, better copper mines and potentially soon one of the world's biggest copper mines, using, of course, Chinese capital. He's not he's not shy of that. Uh, I mean, all, all of this clearly serves to showcase that we have a growing OECD demand for whatever, you know, copper, tin, uranium, um, and a dropping OECD availability of deals for those metals. Now, because... Well, again, we're not focusing on, on things that are really important. It also shows that the Chinese, by the way, will just go anywhere and they will spend any amount of money to get their hands on these metals. And that should be telling us something. And I do actually mean anywhere, by the way, because they're also one of the few companies that are still pushing for deep sea mining. And while I do make fun of that pipe dream um, all the time, because well, number one, really because of CapEx and timelines and time value of money, and therefore, I guess, CapEx and, and OPEX sizes too. But so the Chinese don't really care about me, um, as they shouldn't. Uh, with the yuan now much more broadly accepted than 10 years ago, the Chinese now basically have, free, i got to be careful saying this, but they basically have free money and they're willing to spend it anywhere. But what's happening right now, mentioning the seabed mining, the International Seabed Authority, whatever that might be, what a job. Well, they announced this Friday that there won't be any of that happening anytime soon, or at least not between... Uh, now in 2025, which in the life of uh, commodities investors like seven minutes, but most countries that make up the committee are actually against seabed mining. So the 2025 date is really just a, a review date. It's sort of a date that they gave to the Chinese and um, I think two other countries or whatever to tell them, hey, here it is. Just shut up. We're going to review it again. You know, maybe we'll think about it. Okay. And um, this wouldn't be the first one, by the way, they've said that before. So you know, I'm I'm far from bullish on seabed mining for what it's worth, which is my opinion, which means that it's not really worth a lot. But in 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 conclusion, the Chinese are really pushing to get their hands on metals in whatever ways that they can. So, I guess also in conclusion to my ramblings here, China's economy is not recovering as expected, which is something that we've known for a while now. But the PMI indicators keep sort of hitting us in the face, which is always nice. I do like that. But in the meanwhile, China is very serious. Uh, sort of trillions of dollars serious about securing its access to critical metals. And Saudi Arabia has just joined the race too, while the West is thinking about how to make us eat bugs, take cold showers, and use decarbonized internet money. So uh, big NGMI energy here, if you ask me, especially provided that, and I didn't talk about that actually now that I'm thinking about it, but I'll mention it briefly. The US just got downgraded by one of its uh, own agencies, Fit, Fitch, I guess, who, who basically says, yeah, you know, listen, you, you say you'll pay all of this back, but the interest on your debt is almost $1 trillion. So NGMI, basically, you know, I'm not going to make it. But, let, you know, we'll, we'll see about it. That's what they're saying. So that's pretty much their conclusion. They downgraded their own, um, their own country, which is... That's not a surprise, I guess, because we keep seeing not as good of data, sort of data that looks good on surface, better than expectations, even in some cases. But again, expectations, how much are those really worth? Uh, so this week, what we saw was the US PMIs, they're falling. Now, not all of them, but some of them, they came below expectations. They come, they're slipping. And this shouldn't come as a surprise either, because given that the jobs report this week show a loss of 2,000 jobs in the manufacturing sector, that should have um, been expected. Uh, and this is this actually so the, the loss of 2000 jobs in the manufacturing sector came um, while we were expecting a growth of 5000 jobs. So we were expecting 5000 jobs to be added. What happened is 2000 jobs were cut. And a main job grower right now is, of course, the government, because that's exactly what we need, a bigger government, um, which, by the way, as I said, is being downgraded with the overall job openings. Um, 
uh, though the overall job openings, by the way, though they're they're still inflated, they're, they're still pretty high. You know, they're between nine and ten million. Um, so th that's a lot. They they did come in lower than last time, and uh, also the jobless claims are not looking exactly nice. I'm not going to go over everything here because the conclusion really is is just going to be not going to make it energy all the way. And uh, yeah, if, with I don't know. I, I, I'm looking at other stuff. I'm looking at energy, for example, looking at oil back again. You know, it's up and running. It stayed above 80 this week. It had a 2% week. And I'm thinking, okay, what happens if, you know, inflation might be back into the CPI in the second half of this year? What's going to happen um, if if the Fed, you know, what's, what's going to happen if we initially understand that the Fed didn't land anything, kind of like me in high school? And it didn't even defeat inflation while it hiked interest rates. What's going to happen if we see that? Well, that, that's sort of where my NGMI energy comes from. P please talk to me. I'm just having sort of random thoughts here that I'm communicating to my future self. So so talk to me about these things. I'm probably getting it wrong. And I want to know how and why I'm getting it wrong so that I can stop getting it wrong, maybe potentially eventually. So commodities, as I said, across the board, they didn't like much of what's been happening. Iron ore, silver, and copper particularly dislike that as they are the worst performing commodities this week. So we have iron ore down 6%, silver is down 3%, copper is down 2.5%. Uh, copper was closely followed by a 2.5% drop in tin and a 2% drop in natural gas. It was actually interesting to see copper down this week, um, not because of anything fundamental, I'm saying it right again, but so not because of anything fundamental, because as I said, China is wobbly, US is wobbly, um, oh, EU inflation, by the way, is still very, very um, stubborn, seeing where it's actually even rising in some countries back again. And so that means more rate hikes. So not uh, copper didn't rise because of anything fundamental, but because copper has finally been added to the critical minerals list in, uh, in the US. It was added by the Department of Energy, of course, of the US. And I mean, it took them long enough to realize that copper should be on that list. But since, since this week, it's now officially a critical material. Uh, following really what what pretty much everybody else in the world has has seen and i don't even mean people who do alternative economics or stuff like that and see stuff clearly i mean slowly working governments like everybody from india through the european union all the way into canada all these governments somehow figured out that copper is a critical uh, material and the U.S., um, it, it took them very long to do that. But so, yeah, this is good news for U.S. copper companies because they can now uh, get tax breaks under the Inflation Reduction Act, of course. Funnily enough, though, I um, I speak to well-informed or at least what I consider to be well-informed people on a, on a daily basis. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure the vast majority of them will, will disagree with the way this list has been made up. Not because of the metals that are on here, but just a way of because of their position. So specifically, because copper gets a three out of five on um, the importance of, of of the importance to energy scale. So there's a scale. I assume it's out of five because that's sort of what the thing tells me. It might have been out of four, but it, they get a three. So it's not even the most important. Uh, it's not even among the most most important ones to the energy um, uh, to energy and. It, it gets a 2.2 .2 out of 5 on the risk of supply scale, which is very interesting to me given given our history of bringing copper mines online is not necessarily swift, um, easy and cheap. So I'll give you some context though. The DOE says that copper is as important to energy as silicon and electrical steel, but is not as important as lithium and nickel, which is really where a debate can be started. Um, and please do start that in the comments below. But so the DOE also says that copper supply is at a lower risk than aluminum, cobalt, graphite, platinum, magnesium, and a bunch of other rare earth metals, um, which I guess I can agree with on some of those rare earth metals. But uranium, of course, is on that list, by the way, so I'll get to that in a second. Yeah, that's when I'll even, that's when it's going to start getting interesting. But overall, there is a lot to disagree with on this list on the DOE here, and I'd be happy again to... To read and mostly agree with your objections in the comments below, but I'm, silver is not on here and stuff like that. But I'm, I'm happy at least copper finally made the list. Now, that's not everything uh, on copper this week is Cadelco. Now, the, the this is, a, um, I believe that's now the second largest copper or maybe even the largest copper producer in the world. And it's owned by the Chilean government. Um, well, Cadelco has now seen its production drop significantly this year. And uh, its guidance for the full 2023 is also very low. Uh, but they are saying that this will be the worst year for copper production in um, in their mines in the last 25. The worst year in the last 25 years. 
But the miner also says that this is as bad as it'll get. This is they say, okay, this is this is this is it. This is it. We're so back. Um now how, what, and why is not really clear. They're not really telling us about that. But if the Chilean government says that it's happening and they say that they will soon increase their copper production back above those levels, then that must mean that it, it actually is going to happen. I don't know. Now, the fact that grades are dropping and supply chain bottlenecks are making the discovery and development of copper assets even harder and riskier than it normally is. Um, on top of growing red tape, uh, you know, disappearing funding and an increasingly left leaning government read communist leaning government across the copper jurisdictions is, is not an importance in this case, apparently. Specifically not because obviously by the time we were actually short those pounds of copper, we'll have figured out some lab made technology to lower our demands um, for, 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 for the metal that shares a color with my hair, I guess, or eventually we'll just substitute it with, I don't know, aluminum or silver or something like that. Um, th that's at least what a study done by the investment banker BMO shows. So they say that copper is now four times more expensive than aluminum, which is true. And that if copper keeps going higher, we'll see a lot more substitution, even though, as you would know, copper is pretty much the best metal for electric wiring because it is more stable, durable, and it performs better, meaning it has better conductivity than aluminum. Actually, aluminum only has about 60% of the conductivity of copper. So... The banker has uh, taken a stance that a lot of copper supply and demand projections that we see out there, the, the, they might be off balance because of overstated demand numbers, which actually makes sense because when the price of scrap metal, um, uh, when the price of the metal goes up, then the, the, the supply of scrap metal also goes up, right? Because more people are incentivized to burn the rubber thing off the copper wires and return uh, the copper for for scrap. And although I don't understand this enough to say whether it's true or not, and how much of it is going to happen, how much effect that's going to have. I do understand enough to say that this is a perfect example of what Energy Burrito told me during our interview earlier this week, where he hammered home the point that when when, when you're investing, or when he's investing, he, he's really looking for supply shortages instead of demand growth. As in, he wants to invest in something that has a very challenged supply and so there's just not enough supply of it right now as opposed to something that is expected to see a lot of demand in the future so think about the difference between uranium and lithium in this case right lithium is expected to see a huge demand boom in the future uh, and uranium on the other hand we just don't have the mines to put online uh, quickly enough to meet the demand that is already there so it that's the difference between um, um you know a, a, a supplies su Supply motivated investment or demand motivated investment, I guess. So, so I, you know, that's something that I do understand. Um, by the way, with BMO, they did conclude the report by saying that while demand might not be exactly where copper bulls expected to, they still believe demand will be high enough to ensure copper growth in the copper prices over the next couple of years. And also, do want to note, by the way, that so far in my brief experience. Higher prices have always, especially with materials that that know a, a, a rather large secondary sort of scrap metals market, higher prices have always been the cure for higher prices in my experience. So if copper spikes to $10 tomorrow, don't be shy to take some of your money off the table, maybe even all of your money off the table, depending on your risk profile. Of course, I'm just bringing this to your attention, making you think about it. I guess I'm not, you know, I'm not saying you watch it because I have no idea what I should do. So how should I even know what you, you or tw whatever, 2,000 people should do? But you know, it's really, it's really reports like these that show us that we we really don't know anything, and supply can come from many different angles that we hadn't calculated, and demand can also be cut from different angles that that maybe we sort of took for granted, right? So high prices almost always cure high prices, and you need to understand that when copper starts running again, you should be thinking. Um, you know, if copper again hits ten dollars a pound, you, you should be thinking about that. You should not just assume that it's it's never going to stop running. At least that's my experience so far. Although I still understand that it's it's not easy to bring mines into production and so on and so forth. We we don't even have significant discoveries or enough significant discoveries to cover some of those demand projections. But again, they do depend on the demand projections. And if the demand is not there, and copper ran into the face of expected demand, demand uh, you know turns out not to have been there. You would have wanted to have taken something off the table, I assume. But again, I'm just bringing it to your attention to think about it when copper, when or if copper starts running. Going back to the list of critical metals, though, before I rant on for too long and say too many silly, stupid things, what's not on there yet is tin. And uh, that, that's interesting to me since 
This week, we finally got confirmation on the Myanmar production, exploration, and export uh, um, a ban of tin, right? As I've reported previously, Myanmar was set to stop tin exports starting August 1. And I told you that, it, 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 you know, this was not the first time that such a country has made such promises. So I said, let, let's wait and see whether it would go through or not. And I said that it would be not great for the tin price if it didn't go through because tin had been running in anticipation thereof. Well, it turns out it did go through. And the tin price didn't really care much about that. But so the WA state of Myanmar is the, the world's largest producer of tin. They supply about 10% of the world's tin. So it may not sound like a lot, but it should sound like a lot when you understand that the WA state makes up the majority of China's tin imports. So China, China obviously a very big consumer of tin. I think it's the biggest consumer of tin in the world. It would make sense if it is. So as I told you last week, China is currently though taking its foot off the tin smelter pedal, and it has turned off a few of those facilities last week, and it's, it's slowing down capacity at others. Uh, they're saying actually that they're doing it just for their annual maintenance work over there, but we all know that they did it in anticipation of the of the of this uh, tin export block out of um, Myanmar. Um, However, the uh, the International Tin Association, that's actually a thing. So the International Tin Association now thinks that the mining and export halt in Myanmar might take a lot longer than initially expected, which was three months. Um, that was what the association initially expected. And if so if this continues for longer than those three months, which again, they are saying it very well might, then that would mean depleting um, above ground inventories, which will either see China dipping its finger in the supply of tin that normally got brought by uh, bought, excuse me, by other countries, and um, paying a premium to get it, or it will basically have to cut their their finished products um, output, their finished tin products output. That's basically one of those two things is going to happen, and then they're also going to have to come to the market and say like, hey, we're actually keeping these facility offs facilities off for a while longer because we just don't have enough tin to feed them. And that would be a very interesting situation, a very interesting announcement to see. As you would know, though, the price, and I just said that the, the price of tin has been climbing for the last six or so months, and it's up 30% in, in, in anticipation of this up in this production or export cut. So with China's slower recovery, the price didn't really move up this week. It actually, as I said, fell. So it is... Um, Again, it will be very interesting to see where, where this goes over the next few months, and especially if there is a Chinese stimulus in combination with a longer than expected ban on tin production, then I do not expect tin to stay under $30,000 a ton for too long. So, And it's been above it, you know, that spike of what is it now, two years ago. It was a very interesting spike. But again, funnily enough, high prices also cured those high prices somehow. Now, going back to that DOE list, uh, uranium is um, is now seen as being at a near critical supply risk and as having a high importance to energy. So that's how they're classifying it. Um, interesting to see that the report deems it at a lower lower supply risk than lithium and nickel. And lithium is marked as having a higher importance to energy than uranium. And I guess this is U.S. centric, of course. So it might make it might make sense. I mean, it depends on how you think about it, but it might make sense. Matter of fact, uranium has the lowest score for uh, highest risk technology, meaning that it, it barely made the list. The score is 23. This is all the way to the bottom. Many other metals have a higher score on here. So although that's not something I can agree with, nobody really cares about my opinion, as I said, as they shouldn't. But it's interesting to see that this conclusion was based on a 2020 estimate for the above ground inventories, which showed about 282,000 tons of uranium in what they call civil stockpiles globally. And I've, I've covered it on this channel a few times, but that number is now nowhere near that level. And this, this actually, this whole thing, this whole report, this whole way of thinking actually explains a lot of the behavior that we've seen from utilities and other parties in the sector over the last couple of months, including, by the way, the less bullish uranium, the less bullish uranium bulls, uh, the bearish uranium bulls, or whatever you want to call them, because there really aren't there, there really aren't any real uranium bears out there. They come on and say, I'm going to short this for the next five years. I haven't met that. If you know someone, connect me to them. It, it always makes for a fun conversation. I have met people who say, yeah, I could see uranium going up, but it's not for me. Um, but so anyways, if you know someone, do connect me to them. But so uh, to get to the point, what this this report shows me is that when a fuel source is, is it, show, it shows me the thinking behind everything. Because when a fuel source is as energy dense as uranium is, it's extremely easy to stockpile a lot of energy. So last time when the cigar lake flooding happened, 
that opened the door. Um, it, it opened the discussion for increasing the independent stockpiles of, of uranium, uh, meaning for utilities specifically, this meant that they started keeping more nuclear fuel in, in their own facilities. And besides costing them money, though not a lot, um, it still made sense to do. It was still relatively easy to store, basically. Now, they did that all throughout 2011 when Fukushima happened. And all of a sudden, the secondary supply of uranium, meaning um, utilities that had fuel on site but weren't about to use it, well, that that's called secondary supply because they were selling that into the market. That secondary supply of uranium started coming onto the market one way or another, albeit um, sort of pure sales of it or actually lending that fuel, which was happening apparently in the case of the Japanese that's something that I recently learned is that they weren't selling that, uh, or some of them at least were not selling it. They were actually lending it out. I, I'm not sure if that's true, so do double check. Uh, but so what that did, basically, you know, that additional uranium fuel going into the market, what that did, besides keeping the price of uranium below the marginal cost of production for an extended period of time, because there was just enough of it. There was no production needed. The market said, we don't want production, so we're not going to... We're not going to reward production with a reasonable ROI because we just we just don't want it. We just don't need it. Well, what that did was that it created a new way of thinking about nuclear fuel and uranium in general, thinking that was not employed before that. I mean, why, after all, would you stockpile uranium into your own facility? So basically bury hundreds of millions of dollars in reserves, though easily stored. It's still money, a lot of it, when a secondary market can just supply you in pretty much any event because there was just so much of it. Well, that was the case between 2011 and 2020. And also even then, by the way, why would you stockpile uranium if Russia's production capacity was at your fingertips as an OECD utility buyer? And again, incredibly easily available, which of course no longer is the case, uh, or at least not the, at the same prices, not with the same level of security of, su security of supply, and um, not at the same speed either, because we're seeing a lot of these routes are challenged to get uranium uh, out of Russia and into the Western reactors. And even then, um, some of the, some of the Western utilities are sort of self-sanctioning, as you would know, some of the US utilities at least. And so the, that way of thinking has been used to, to, to construct this report as well, or at least that's my belief, which is where the conclusion came from to, to put uranium at, at nearly critical supply instead of critical supply risk. However, those assumptions for those stockpiles, they are in my opinion, way too conservative. Uh, that that opinion, by the way, that I have, that I when I say that's my opinion, that opinion has been formed by reading what the good people like Borja out there are, are putting out on Twitter, where we see that uh, the the supposed inventory of the French and Japanese utilities as balance sheet is 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 nowhere near the levels that we thought it was before, and they're doing restarts and they're doing reactor life extensions. So, yeah. We've also had, you know, plenty of, of reactor life extensions since 2020, not only in uh, France and, and now Japan, and a bunch of other things that would have just put additional stress on those civil stockpiles that they're mentioning here in this report, because they're using the 2020 number. But both ways, the report in, in this, this chart specifically, I'm probably have a chart on your screen right now. Well, this chart specifically does acknowledge the fact that there is currently, right now, there is a supply deficit in pretty much any demand scenario. Any of the realistic demand scenarios, of course. Sure, the production capacity, however that might have been measured, is there. It is the production capacity, and that is there. There is some production capacity there, but not at these prices. And it is not sitting in a shack in the middle of Africa. And if it were, that might not even be going out of there as far as we know. And it's not for today or tomorrow, right? But it will take time to do the actual production capacity. It will take time to turn it on. Even the brownfields can be notoriously slow and difficult, expensive and unreliable to bring into production. As to the outer demand scenarios of which I'm pretty confident we will, we will, <laughs> what is wrong with me? We will overshoot all of them, including the D one, the green one on here, um, well, in those cases, there is a continued supply shortage throughout this and even well into the middle of the next decade. Even if the production capacity that is often used by doubters was brought online easily and cheaply and reliably and quickly, which is not happening. But so, yeah, you know, I like this report. I like that this report highlights the, that. Well, number one, it highlights the thinking that a lot of people, I think the vast majority of people out there have employed over the last um, couple of years and are still employing. Which has been, you know, sort of this, um, oh, well, we'll figure it out somehow. There's a lot of uranium out there. Don't worry about that. That's a general thinking, right? That's when you talk to someone who does not follow the space closely and on a daily basis, that's always the answer. 
And then when you say, well, if there was a lot of uranium out there, how is the price $60 and not 16 Well, there's no answer to that. There's mostly some other counter arguments that don't make too much sense. But anyways, that's been the thinking. And it also this also highlights the report how, highlights that there is a actual an actual supply deficit of uranium at the moment even if the demand if the demand scenario was not to play out exactly as we expected and this is the doe telling you this they are extremely conservative and actually so conservative that they're often wrong however the chances for the said demand scenario the the, the high demand scenario to uh the not well yeah the chances for the high demand scenario not to play out in an overshoot really are, are decreasing by the weeks Sometimes I even think that it might be I might be better off making uranium only weekly updates because there's, there's just so much going on in this space. So for this week, I picked China, of course, to talk about because there were big news coming out of China, uh, specifically that the, the, the China has now approved six new nuclear reactors. Those are the first ones to get approved this year after 10 were approved last year but it's still early on in the year of course so we are on track to get between the promised eight to ten nuclear reactors per year i think china has said that they are going to um approve yeah eight to ten nuclear reactors per year over the next five or four years or something among those lines so we are on track to get there but what's more with these reactors is the speed at which china is aiming to build them which is promised to be at about four to five years per reactor and so it's um it's even more impressive that they're doing this at under three billion dollars per reactor, with the total cost of these six reactors being estimated sixteen point eight billion dollars. I simply have divided that by six. Even I can do that, well, using a calculator, of course. And so that price is around what two point eight billion dollars. And those are not small reactors, by the way. All six are actually they're all six different. Well, not all six are different, but they are. I believe the three different types of reactors in those six. So two two of each. Um. All six of them are estimated to be uh, above uh, 1,000 megawatts. Um, and, and two of them are, are even 1,300 megawatt reactors. So again, anything but small reactors. Actually, with some of the delays um, that China has seen across the globe, you know, even with those delays, some of, the, some of the reactors that China is building domestically, but also specifically I'm going to be talking about uh, the reactors that China is building outside of China, like, for example, the Pakistan, Pakistani reactor, that was um, started, planned, whatever, in 2017. When it was 2017, basically, Pakistan shook China's hand and said, hey, you're going to build this reactor for us, right? Well, so they shook their hand in 2017, and it has only gotten full approval now. So this is, what, six years later, six plus years later. And the cost there is estimated at 3.7 billion, billion US dollars. So it is not as expensive as I would have expected it, given the six-year delay in, in red tape, basically, unnecessary red tape. Although you do want red tape, but maybe not as much, and not as much roadblocks. So nuclear can be cheap and fast as well. Um, $3.7 billion does not sound cheap in absolute amounts, but it definitely is when you, when you think about the reactors that anti-nuclear folks often use as examples of nuclear not being cheap it can be cheap and it can be fast as well that's all that i'm trying to see here and i'm also bringing it up because in that in in that case you know that green line of that supply and demand scenario of the doe report well that will seem a lot more reasonable knowing how quickly and cheaply the chinese can build nuclear and also assuming that other countries or at least the ones that are reasonably led which there's not many of them but it, uh, assuming those countries will see the effect uh, the building nuclear will have on the Chinese economy and the Chinese environment, and they will opt for it too. Um, some people are even speculating uh, Germany will get back to reopening reactors. I cannot speculate that far, even though I'm not too far from Germany myself. Nobody really knows what's happening in there. Very, very. I mean, the the anti nuke movement is incredibly embedded in them. Like I sometimes go on sort of road trips and hiking trips in Germany. There are houses, multiple houses in some of these streets that have, uh, you know, the sort of the sign that says um, uh, nuclear energy, no thank you, on their windows. Like, this is an actual serious thing. But anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself because we ha we should be talking about Cameco. Because during its Q2 investor call this week, Cameco showed this chart that shows two scenarios for a demand, a base case one and a high case one. And in both cases... We surpassed the DOE's highest case for demand. So as I told you, the DOE is very, very, very conservative with demand. And although we don't want to listen to the uranium CEOs people, of course, about the quality of the market, and you shouldn't listen to CEOs when they start talking and telling you how great the uranium market 
in my personal experience, having spoken to the guys at Cameco, they are incredibly intelligent. They're incredibly experienced. They're just top notch. Be the the best of the best in this business. Okay, and at the same time, they're also literally the guys traveling around signing contracts. So forgive me, but I will choose to trust them over any researcher at the DOE any day of the week. That's it's pretty. I've just that's just a base assumption of mine, and so. While the DOE says that the high case is around 176 million pounds of demand per year in 2025, Cameco says its base case is over 200 million pounds of demand and the discrepancy in 2025, and the discrepancy gets even larger towards the middle of the next decade. And so this is Cameco's base case versus the DOE's high case. Again, it should not depend on demand. As I said, it's not important, but even in the base case, supply is undershooting demand. Because both at the current tempo, at the current tempo of good news, by the way, it is, however, more re more than reasonable to assume that the demand for nuclear fuel will keep growing throughout this decade, and and well into the next one as well. And, and of course, the opposite is true when it comes down to the supply, because based on recent events, it is more than reasonable to assume that the supply of uranium will um will will either come late or it will not come towards the OECD countries at all. And the supply in OECD countries is having its own roadblocks, which is why uranium, in my case, is a supply thesis, supply-driven thesis, as opposed to a demand-driven thesis. Although it is also a demand-driven thesis that we have high, you know, a, a, a high, high probability of, of seeing come through. And so that right there, by the way, is your both thesis in a nutshell. M matter of fact, Uranium Insider, who is is much better than me with words, uh, said it much better on Twitter this week. And uh, I'm just going to quote it. He said, quote, demand is stable and growing. Supply is in question, unquote. That's it. That, that's that, that's a thesis right there. That That's absolutely it. If I didn't require any food and if my wife didn't have an expensive taste, I would probably stop making these videos about Uranium right here, right now, because... All that there is to to this thesis now is just waiting, and there is going to be waiting. So, you know, I oftentimes see people who say, "Oh, I've heard the same story since uh, late 2021 or early 2022." I'm like, "Okay, so it's been a year and a half, two years. It's going to be waiting. This sector moves slowly." And although nobody has a crystal ball, although some days it feels like I have two, the spot price of uranium is suggesting that the waiting. Um, although long, might not be as long as some people might be expecting it. And that is because the spot price is up yet again this week for the fourth week in a row. And although I'm repeating myself, I'm still going to go ahead and say it. This is not normal. Normally, during the summer months, and especially after a run-up like the one of the last 12 or so weeks, we go down. But we have been going up for the last four weeks, and I'm just liking it. And I'm very curious to see what happens during the rest of Q3, by the way, of this year, when everybody's back to work in September. And... um. A few buyers are looking for uranium, but they're finding corporate drama. They're finding African coups. They're finding financial players back at full power and all that kind of th things all over the place, which makes yellow cake less readily available, if you will. And that also, by the way, get, got confirmed by, um, by uranium buyers flexing up their contracts this week, basically proving to the market that the days of unlimited secondary supply are close to over. Why I'm bringing financial players into this, by the way, and then I'll go back to flexing up the contracts um, into the mix here, is, is because this week, the Sprott and Physical Uranium Trust had an 8% green week, and it's closed at a 52-week high. And that, of course, pushed the discount to NAV to uh, very low levels, and it's now only at a 3.3% discount. So we're getting close to the place where the flywheel will be activated again, and it will start pushing the spot price up, therefore the, the equities, and therefore back the spot price, and so on and so forth. And if that happens before uranium seasonality is in full power, which is sort of October-ish, well, then the utilities will be in an even more interesting situation. Throw in replacement rate contracting, which we're pretty much certain that certain certainly reaching this year, and the setup has never really looked better, at least in my opinion. And why I'm even bringing, I, I will go to utilities flexing up their contracts, by the way, but why I'm even bringing replacement rate contracting in this is because Kazanoprom released its Q2 results this week, showing that its customers are asking for more uranium. In essence, that's what it, what it, what it is, because the group changed its sales outlook from 15.9 thousand tons this year to 18 thousand tons. While get that, this is the best part, keeping its production guidance unchanged at 21.5 thousand tons 
at a 100% basis. In the best case scenario, this is the best case scenario production, 21.5 thousand tons. So best case, because Adam, because Adam Prompt's production is 85% signed up. Worst case, or more reasonable case, it's almost 90%. And on the higher case, there's just no more uranium that Adam Prompt can sell you. Um, if they don't tap into the spot market, which they've told us that they will have to, and now uh, that's by the way what's flexing up, uh, what, what the flexing up of contracts means that I referenced. It basically means that because Adam Prompt's customers, that well, assumingly being the utilities, are asking for their uranium earlier than normally, uh, that than what their contract said, and that's incredibly that's an incredibly bullish development because when the secondary supply is deemed to be, you know, basically unlimited or let's just call it. <clears throat> excuse me, easily easily available, easily accessible, then contracts usually are flexed down or basically delayed where utilities say, hey, you know, we signed a contract for um, whatever, 5,000 5, um, tons this year. Why don't you deliver me four and a half? Because they know that they can go on a secondary market and get it uh, more cheaply. And then, because Adam Prime is basically storing that for them. But when contracts are flexed up, which is what's happening right now, basically sped up, well, well, that basically is telling us that utilities no longer have the same access to the, to uranium on the spot market because they're now asking for more uranium to be delivered this year than what they normally thought they might need. And of course, one of the financial players too, so Yellow Cake PLC has also a role in this because specifically with Kazan and Prom's case because they're exercising their option to buy uranium from the Kazakhs. Um, they had an option, as you would know, and now they're exercising it. As to Cameco, um, their Q2 results were also published this week, and they too increased their guidance, but not by as much. Um, they they said that they're now expecting two and a half billion dollars in revenue, for, and that's that's up from the previous guidance that was between two point two and two point four billion dollars. It's kind of funny when I say it. Oh, what's three hundred million dollars between friends? So this is happening because, uh, as Tim said, he basically said, "Hey, you know what? I'm just a great operator." I've managed to sell uranium in spots nobody believed a Western company ever could. Uh, and I was even man enough to charge them higher prices than what you guys normally charge them. So that's what he said. Well, not in those exact words, but it pretty much resembled them closely. According to sources close to the matter, that shall remain unneed. Uh, oh, and also, by the way, um, he added that we're going into replacement rate contracting. But more importantly, I've been told by a fuel buyer that replacement rate contracting doesn't even indicate demand right now. So what this means is that the demand uh, is actually more than the replacement rate, what the replacement rate contracting is assumed to be. So what this means is that the 118 million pounds of U3 await that was signed at the end of Q2, that's actually not everything because there are buyers uh, out there. Actually, there are buyers out there who own mines, right? Specifically in China, of course, where those pounds don't even show up on any of those markets. So when you're looking at UXC's number about how many pounds have been um contracted this year, that's not in there. So in reality, a lot more than the 118 million pounds has been purchased this year. It's somewhere between 150 and 180 million pounds already in the first half of 2023, or so I've been told. Now, by the way, you cannot just look at this and say, okay, then, you know, 150 million pounds in H1, that means 300 million pounds contracted or, or demanded, so to say, over the full 2023. That's not that's not a that's usually not a right approach. Although it is not impossible to see 300 million pounds contracted, it's not reasonable to annualize demand like that. Mainly because the reason, by the way, I finally figured it out. I didn't figure it out. Someone told me that. But the reason why demand it has been so high in H1 this year is is because of the speculations around Russian EUP bans and um, at the beginning of this year. So it's basically a hedge that utilities started looking for. Uh, they're trying to fill up their bugs before Russian EUP get, gets banned. Or so again, I'm told. But so if if um, it, it, it's also still very likely that both Cameco and Kazana Prom will be buyers in the spot market this year on top of everything going on because, well, because they basically told us that they would. Um, and so what this means is that we'll see pressure both on the term market, but also on the spot market. Now, you shouldn't only listen to what the companies are telling you, of course, although they don't really necessarily have a benefit by telling you that they're going to be buying in a spot market um, because they can have other people front run them. But they do communicate that. But they not only are they seeing this, they're actually proving this because during this investor call of um, of Q2, Cameco said that its contractual obligations for the 2023 to 2027 period have gone up from 26 million pounds to 28 million pounds, while their production 
even if they were to ramp up to full capacity magically overnight, which is not happening, but even if they were, then the production capacity goes to 32 million pounds. So it is very close to being very full. Right now, though, if we just assume their uh, Kazakh JV will deliver the rightful pounds, which it has failed to do so, it's it's actually pretty late, though it is expected that they will be able to get their share out of the Inkai uh, Kazakh JV. But even if they were to come in and everything goes as planned, everything goes as normal this year, well, Cameco's production is at 26.6 million pounds per year right now, which is 1.8 million pounds short of their already signed capacity over the next four years. And that's only at the end of Q2. It's literally only half of the year with the latter half of the year, by the way, the year, the 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 the, the, the H2 of, of every year being notoriously the time the utility sign contracts. Again, I'm not saying this is going to happen this year because we've seen H1 weighted contract signing, although it may, it might, right? So I just cannot even imagine what it's like to be a utility fuel buyer on vacation right now and coming back to all these developments in some, you know, three, three and a half, maybe four weeks. And so... Well, I cannot imagine it partly because it's been 84 years since I've been on vacation, but I'm I'm not complaining. I'm having fun. <laughs> However, as I said on Twitter, I got into uranium not because it's easy, but because I thought it would be easy. So don't take my enthusiasm at face value here. I've still not made any money in this space. Um, and I just literally I just literally learned how to tie my own shoes. Okay. Um so Again, I, I've worn a diaper for longer than I've had facial hair, so I'm not to be trusted. I, this is really just me documenting what I learned about the thesis on a weekly basis so that I can show this to my kids and show them that even if you're at an 80 IQ or below 80 IQ and you're almost always wrong, you can still get married if you're kind to your wife. So that, that this is all there is to it. But at the same time, all of this in uranium, by the way, is happening while there are troubles in Niger, as you would know. Um but at least now I get to shut up because, again, I spoke to Andrew Chubb. He's a geologist who's lived in Burkina Faso. He's worked and traveled through Mali. He's worked in Guinea, and he's most importantly worked in Niger him itself. He's been there during coups and so on and so forth, and he currently works in the Ivory Coast, which is a completely different jurisdiction than those other jurisdictions, of course. For disclaimer and honest confession, though, Andrew is currently the CEO of Awali Resources, which is a company that I own shares of, and it's also a paying advertiser of this channel, which means that I'm absolutely more than biased, and this should be seen as advertisement and not as independent research. But I still think this conversation gave me at least a, a better read of the situation, a sort of a first-person experience to see what's actually going on in the ground, because it appears that not nobody really knows what's happening. So let's listen to Andrew. All right, Andrew, so there's there's a lot, uh, almost too much going on in the Sahel region right now um, that, that I don't understand. So I, I don't even know what to ask you here off the get-go. And um, may, maybe a good question would be, why is it even the Sahel, the Sahel region that specifically goes through these uh, turbulent times, given that you've, uh, you've lived in Burkina Faso, as you told me, you've worked in Mali, you've worked in Niger, you've worked in Guinea. Um, yeah, why, why, why are they having troubles? Yeah, I guess that's a tough one. I, look, I think they they are they are poor countries. Um, I think I think there's a particularly large. I mean, these are these are my observations and opinions, right? And and I do read and I do look at what's going on and and and. But I think um, I think particularly in sort of Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, um, the, the, there was unfortunately for some of for, particularly for Burkina, there was a a coalescence of things sort of of change um but one of the big things was that that i i i whether whether it was underestimated or not i think i think um libya had an extreme extremely strong influence on sub-saharan africa um and so particularly in that belt that you're talking about in west africa so from from uh, senegal across you know, through Mali uh, in, into Niger, um, the, 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 um, the, there was a very strong influence in those countries. They are more Muslim or, you know, they're, they're you know, 90 plus percent um, Muslim in those countries. Um, the, the Gaddafi family built a lot of mosques um, and, and, you know, through, through those sort of, Things they have, you know, influence. They have political influence because 
a lot of the information um, to the population in those in those regions is actually disseminated by the imams. Um, and and we even as a company, and you know, not just like our current company, in, in other companies, when we're doing regional scale things, I had, we we have guys that go and talk to the imams and and let them know what we're doing, and they they are one of the avenues that we we you know disseminate information about what we are planning to do um, is from an exploration perspective as a company. So if we're flying regional magnetic surveys or anything like that so anyway and so i you know there there is there is so there is political influence that was there um and and since sort of Gaddafi was deposed that is not there anymore and and then with Gaddafi being deposed as well um he also had a very strong um i guess military influence um further north as well so that's you know, with with various factions like the Tuareg factions of Ansar Dine and these others, um, Gaddafi again had extremely strong relationships with all these people, and so that left when he went, that left a vacuum, and and it also um, left a vacuum in that um, a lot of the um, military that were connected to him and his family, or the Libyan military they just sort of fell apart as well and a lot of their weapons just ended up in the wrong hands and even the guys that were working for them because, of you know, they probably weren't getting paid, <laughs> right? So they just go and work for someone uh, as in, in a new military team for people who were paying them. Hmm. And, and so, you know, it, it just, that, that, again, these are all, these are my opinions and my observations, um, but, but, you know, that, that opens doors for um, other more global political factions to, to, to start to have influence um, in those in those areas. And so it then, seems like it seems like the, the, the West, if you will, so Europe is, is losing its, its grip on Africa, if you will. But it also seems like some of these countries are growing alliances with uh, Russia and are pushing for Europe's exit out of the region. Like if you look at Niger, you have yeah. these pro-Russia protests. Yeah, uh, I yeah I saw that yesterday. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I I'm not aware of how many people there were, and 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 the funny, you know, or who organised the rally, um, and and did did the did the um, you know the new um, president. And his people organised the rally and all those sorts of things. And and I think um, at the moment, unfortunately, with some of these, because they're being marginalised by um, other in other political arenas, potentially that they are looking towards, you know, um, uh, other um, greater political players that 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 might be able to help them or that they perceive might be able to help them and and what and what their cause um may be um look if you look at you know how many i mean if you look at the people that actually turned up <laughs> to the to the to the summit with russia a couple of weeks ago um you know uh, 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 the bulk of them were 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 countries that have got military governments and um, and and so and and that are not being recognised by um, political prop, you know, like the African Union or the Euro, you know the the cooperation of African West African states, ECOWAS. Um, they, these are the guys that are turning up to those meetings, and and you know South Africa was there as well. But in theory, like the the idea is that what I've read is that you know the, the South Africans have, have been Ramaphosa's tried to influence Russia and, and the Ukraine and and South and and all of Africa has got a vested interest in the Ukraine because um, wheat mm. and 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 um and so I think you know there was that there was a hope of the African nations that potentially there could be a persuasion that that um, the Ukrainian grain block would be um, dropped. And and then you know the African countries wouldn't have to worry about a supply shock uh, on grain. 
Um, and you know, I don't know. I, 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 it's, it's, it's with you know these guys. I'm not sure. I, I, I think a lot of these guys that they don't necessarily have um, the greater picture at really at heart. What um, even happens though is. Like what I what I imagine that is happening, or at least uh, I speculate in my own head that it might be happening, is is a pivot um, in Africa, f- in in these countries, in the Sahel region specifically, from their relationships with the West to pivoting to more relationships with Russia and China because of the resources. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I look. I mean, they're definitely there, and and and. But I think you know there is a there is also. Um, you know, in countries like Ghana and 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 Cote d'Ivoire, um, you know, that have and and Senegal as well, they they you know, like any poli- any political players, they will talk to everyone. I, I think there's an element of caution as well with with those with the stronger with the with the countries that are more politically stable. Um, they're they you know they're not sort of trying to walk into Russia and China with a, effectively with a hat in hand because you know they're not um, they're not um, <laughs> they're not democratically elected people. They're actually you know when, when you're like that when, when you come into power like that on you know they they still need support right and and if you're not getting you know you don't necessarily have all the support of your population and, and surrounding countries as well so. Potentially, you look elsewhere for for support, which is unfortunate, um, and we just have to wait and see what will happen um, from from that perspective. Um, and, and the hope is that it doesn't actually destabilize those countries um, even more. But uh, but the the platform they're coming in on is that they are looking to stabilize the countries against um, the various warlord kind of factions that now exist. Um, in those regions, so um, that's that's their platform. What happens though? This is what what I care about as uh, someone who has investments in in some of those, um, or at least close to that region. What happens to mining companies in that case? Like, I don't imagine the military all of a sudden become uranium miners or uranium geologists. So, is there just a switch of power? And what happens to the companies that had licenses previously? H- historically, in my experience, mines just keep operating. Under the same order, so, yeah. Um, you know, um, the, the, every now and then there are rare cases of some sort of, you know, um, taking of a of a mine from somebody or something like that. And and look, um, but historically, if there's been that sort of sort of uh, um, those sort of troubles, I mean, Mali's had its fair share of coups over the last. You know, ten to fifteen years. Um, you know, uh, and 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 none of the mines have changed hands. They just keep operating, and and some of the biggest deposits in West Africa are in Mali. Um, you know, the, effectively, um, it's been the same in Burkina, um, but you know where the warlords have taken over, it's becoming increasingly difficult because the incumbent government or the government isn't isn't actually in charge. So. Um, in, in some areas, so it's it's probably becoming a little bit difficult for some to operate. Um, but if you know if there is that um, historically, that's basically what what has happened is people just keep operating. Um, the civil wars that happen in Cote d'Ivoire, there are you know Benicro, um, Yaure, these deposits they just kept chugging along. Um, and and like I said in in Mali, those those you know Siama, Lulo, Guntoko. All these mines, they just keep chugging along. They haven't, they haven't uh, changed hands or anything like that. They just, they just keep, keep going. Hmm. And is that? Have you been like because you said you worked in uh, Mali, Niger, Guinea, and um, you lived in Burkina Faso? Have you been in country while something like that was happening? Um. Uh, well, I was in like so when Campore was deposed, I was in Burkina Faso. Um, and um, and and uh, on lockdown, uh, all those sorts of things, um, and uh, with curfews, and uh, and you know it was okay. 
Um, it's not like uh, I was a target in my, you know, little house in, in, a, in, in, in or anything like that. And and um, so, you know, it, it was it was all okay. And and again, during that revolution, which was a revolution, I mean, the the, the uh, Campore would, had been in power there for twenty six or twenty eight years or something like that. Um, all those mines just kept operating. Um, and you know. Um, hmm. The, the you know and in the regions that I've been working in you know I haven't been in those regions because because I'm sort of been in exploration if, if if there has been issues I've tended to 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 either just not go in there or if I was in there I would leave but the operating mine sites that are established and all that sort of thing they just haven't changed they just keep operating I'm mostly thinking about um exploration and also development projects and how that slows them down because i imagine you just said curfew and lockdowns and stuff like that that does slow down the the, the development of the mine and it's probably also a financing issue for the companies that are there right oh yeah th those things those things definitely can happen because you don't have i mean if you don't have cash flow or you know something like that you know um then then that it might prove prove difficult you know you might have some difficulties it is it is possible yeah um, but like I said, like during the, you know, I mean, it, during those times, the, the, you know, there might be a, a short period of, you know, instability. But when when the new government sort of made its way and they're there and you've got that, historically, people have just gone back in and started working. I mean, uh, you know, it's, you're really just minding your own business and doing your job. And, and there's a general understanding that, you know, these sorts of things, projects are actually good for the country and 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 you know um creates local employment and 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 hopefully you know in the long run creates you know taxation income and things like that for the country so there is a recognition of those sorts of things okay okay yeah i don't think i have too many other questions around um around political situation but i think it comes down to these countries are, are different i mean those are not the only countries that you've worked in uh but the african continent is not one country and it's not uh, one political stability or one, one political system so it's they're all different countries um and they're definitely not the same i think that's what it also comes down to yeah i mean that, that, that's absolutely true um you know um you know what yeah it's absolutely true there's there's no other way to put it put it that in that you know if there's something going on in Burkina or mali or you know, somewhere else like that, that, you know, it's business as usual in Cote d'Ivoire and uh, or Ghana or, you know, one or the other, you know, there, there, there's no, just because something's happening in one place doesn't mean it's going to happen in the, in the next one. And, um, and, and it, it's actually unlikely <laughs> um, that, that, that it's just going to, because it happened here, it's going to happen there. It's, uh, it's not necessarily um, the case. All right, so in conclusion, I'm just going to repeat what I said when I intro to Andrew. Nobody really knows what's happening there since Gaddafi was taken down. And not even the guys behind the coups themselves. They they don't necessarily want know what they want. Obviously, they want food and they want weapons. So for now, this still serves as a good reminder that you either have to understand the jurisdiction that you're investing in very in-depth so well that things like this don't affect you emotionally you know either okay this is going down the toilet let me just sell or okay this is just some you know just short-term bs let me buy more if you know and understand the jurisdiction enough to take that decision without any emotion sure okay maybe you could go all in on that jurisdiction that's not most of us though that is definitely not most of us for most of us this shows that we should be well diversified and possibly well outside of the resource space too especially if our wife's uh expensive tastes depend on it so talking about that there were two potentially significant discoveries this week um of new why i'm just kidding um uh, potentially uh, significant discoveries and uh, a bunch of other interesting news from from companies in the space and of course i learned about them from luke and harvard so let's listen to that conversation um with luke and harvard from golddiscovery.com all right luke this is um gonna be an interesting i gotta stop saying this i'm saying it every week but it, it, this one it is because we're finally talking about real discoveries because you're called golddiscovery.com and we've not been talking too much about discoveries but this week 
we're talking about two discoveries and I see two stocks that are up 200%. So I want to know how, what, and why. Thanks, uh, Antonio. Uh, real discoveries, I think it's too early to call them real discoveries. Well, they are real, uh, but we don't know yet. The jury is still out if this will become meaningful, but it seems meaningful for sure. Um, Aston Bay announced a, well, American West announced a major copper discovery. I was awake in the night by coincidence because my son was crying and I saw the news, so I started reading it and was quite impressed. So I was up all night reading, following the market. Um, Storm is a project that has been in Aston Bay for many years, uh, at least 10 years. And they have done deals with Antofagasta and BHP. Uh, then they have explored it themselves with the support of Dave and Broughton, uh, who also was involved with the Ivanhoe discoveries. And in 2021, did a joint venture deal with American West, uh, the Australian listed company. Tiny company at the time, 10 or $15 million company. And they have to spend, I think, $10 million to get to into the first earn-in step. And then they have to bring it to production. Uh, so Aston Bay is carried on their 20%. Uh, and what, what does it really, what does it mean, this news? Um, I think Aston Bay has been looking for, with all their partners, for uh, sedimentary hosted copper. And they have a very high-grade discovery, shallow, um, very shallow, and that was made already a long time ago. But that's not what the majors were looking for. They were looking for this big, perhaps Ivanhoe-style copper deposit. And used various technologies, but never really found it. So that's why both big companies walked away. And now the Aussies came in, and they have two targets. Uh, one is bringing that smaller production, that smaller project deposit in production by drilling it off and making it a DSO direct shipping operation um, and trying to find this sedimentary hosted system. And they have been using gravity. Um, gravity, as I'm told, is not the first thing you use for these type of systems, but they have done a very big gravity survey. And this survey confirms that the last hole they drilled last year perhaps skimmed this sedimentary hosted copper system. Uh, so they had to wait because they have very short seasons and they drilled two holes into the into the main part of that gravity anomaly and apparently the top of that anomaly so the predicted the predicted de depth that's where they found visual copper uh, one hole with uh, chalcopyrite and the other hole with uh, calcocyte and even though they don't have assays yet the number two hole like the last hole seems to have some high grade copper you never know for sure, but it's very likely that they have at least a number of meters of high grade. But will it be 5% or 3%? There's likely to be a meter of maybe 5 6 7% uh, because there's native copper as well. Uh, but the assays are going to be important. But what they what is even more meaningful for them is, hey, we have a technique now that actually brings us, finds for us what we need. Um and now they want to test it in other areas as well. So I was a bit surprised for them to start drilling in a new target. Uh, but the reason they do it right now is um, they are not 100% sure. Could it be coincidence that the gravity anomaly and the depth predict predicted is exactly you know, matching what they find in the drill hole? So they are now drilling a new anomaly, completely new. And I expect some visuals very soon. Uh, because if they can really prove it's really the gravity, then they have a tool to find these type of systems on their property. And then suddenly, you know, they have enormous potential. And that's why the market is up this week. Uh, Aston Bay is up this week uh, 200%. And American West is up 57%. But they already started moving when the gravity survey came out and sort of confirmed what they hit last year could be part of that system they were looking for. Do you think the market is getting ahead of itself here? No, I don't think so. When potentially big discoveries are made, you know, a stock, I mean, Aston Bay was trading at five or six million dollars. And they, you know, if you, if, very easy phrase, but if you can own, you know, 20% of a world class discovery, you should get some speculative upside, right? I mean, the, the, you never know. But when there's a new discovery, a potential new discovery, and 
I, I, I don't. I think it's it's a little bit of a stretch to compare it to Kakua, uh, Kamoa Kakula, uh, but that's sort of the first thing that comes to mind because that's also mm. a sedimentary hosted system. You think about billion dollar, multi billion dollar projects. So if that's the potential, so the best case scenario, uh, and you're trading at a five million market cap, it's not really weird that a stock doubles or triples. Um, the America, the Australian company. American West is trading at 110 million Aussie, 120, I think. Um, I think that next hole, if, if that next hole also confirms native copper and sedimentary hosted chalcosite, I think there's still, I mean, there's, there's, there are going to be, there's going to be a lot of drilling required to really prove that to have something. But if they have a couple of holes that prove the thesis and make it more likely that they have something like it, you will always get upside. And that's why discoveries sometimes go vertically up. And crash back down if after a couple of months, or in this case, probably only next year, the next holes are not going to prove that thesis. But uh, I think for sure right now, it, 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 it makes sense to me that the stocks are going up like this. Um, because, yeah, if American West, if the complete project is worth in the future, and that's a big, big, big question mark, a billion dollar, then, you know, uh, Aston Bay could be worth 250 million or 200 million. Uh, but of course, that's just speculating. It's way too early. Uh, to talk about billion of do- billions of dollars, but um, that's sort of the dream that comes to mind when you uh, read these things. Sure. They also have um, a well-connected team based on what I can see with Aston B specifically. That, so so probably, um, you know, going to help them out in the future if they keep drilling what they've been drilling because they haven't had the this success. They haven't had it so far, although they have been after it for a while. I do not completely agree on this one. Uh, they had a financing open for about four or five months. And there was no interest. So well-connected. I'm not saying that they are not well-connected, but for some reason, the results were not good enough for investors to invest in Aston Bay. They have a little bit of a history. Uh, there were some problems with big investors a couple of years ago where the investors had different things in mind and there were some arguments and there was a lot of chatter online about Aston Bay and maybe it hurt the company's name a little bit. Um, But I think it's good that the Aussies took the option because the Aussies sort of looked at it in a fresh way. Uh, In the last couple of weeks, I talked to Australian investors every now and then. I've got some, you know, some real ASX-focused friends uh, who are starting a small fund and they look at Australian miners mostly and they were very impressed by what uh, American West was announcing in the gravity and all the different news hot copper you know the the website there was a lot of hype about that company and so that company started moving and Aston Bay was staying behind because the Canadians sort of look at Aston Bay as a herd story where you know and not right now now that the Aussies are rising and this big news release came out Finally, investors are back and want to own Aston Bay again. And um, I think it's good for both of them because the, Auss- the Aussies probably can help Aston Bay get some traction, pr- perhaps get some Australian investors to the Canadian markets if there's a you know if there's an arbitrage. Right now, there is not because I think Aston Bay gets full value right now for their 20%. Um, so it's probably a good move by Aston Bay to get these, the Aussies involved. And... Um, yeah, there's a lot of interest. I mean, if you looked at the CEO channel, all the, the well-known names bought stock. And on Twitter, everybody is announcing like, hey, I own stock of this company. So everybody wants mm-hmm. to be part of the story. It's still very risky, I think, in my mind. Um, I also own it. But uh, I, 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 it's not a confirmed thing yet. Uh, it, it is confirmed that this technology, it, it's likely this, that this technology is really helping them. And it's confirmed that they found something new that they didn't know about before. Uh, now the next hole, there's one more, more hole left for this year, and then we will have to wait for six, seven, eight months because then the season is over, and only in uh, towards next summer they will be able to drill again. And uh, they have another project, Aston Bay can drill on another project in the summer or in the winter. Um, not sure if that's a smart thing to do. I think they will debate about that question, but um, it's going to be a little bit boring, uh, perhaps, unless they come up with other news. I mean, the essays will still take four weeks and then the, ne- the next hole will take another four weeks and then they may get another investor involved uh, because I think they will need more financing than the one that's currently open. Uh, so there will be some news over the winter on this project, but no drilling uh, after this hole. And now that this happens, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, are the Aussies going to get a big investor on their side because they own 80? They will own 80%. 
Uh, is Aston Bay going to get strategic in- interest? I mean, this opens up a lot of things. Uh, it's not a co- the first hole that they announced this week. The visual doesn't even seem so high grade. It's probably going to be low grade. The other hole uh, is probably going to be high grade if you look at the visuals and the descriptions and the percentage, uh, the percentage copper or chalcosite involved. Uh, so it's going to be likely some high grade within the second hole. Maybe five meters of high grade and maybe thirty meters of medium grade copper uh, perhaps uh, but it, it's a, it's a start i mean now they have something to follow up on and that's i think why the market's excited yeah well the market is very excited the volumes are just uh, 17 million shares traded this week uh, on aston b so it's uh, they have about 180 million shares outstanding and so at this tempo so this is a million and a half that traded hands this week on aston b and that's not it's definitely not typical for for TSXV companies. No, and it, it may even be a bit more. I'm not completely sure if uh, if I just took the TSXV volume, but or also the other markets, because in Canada you have also all these other small markets, and they are not always included in all the data sets. So I'm not sure if there's one and a half million. I think it may even be more if you include the smaller exchanges. Uh, but if you look at, for example, um, American West they had $25 million of volume. <laughs> and I was looking at level two uh, a little bit. And sometimes you, you, see, you see a big ask at 26, 27 cents. And in one swipe, they take out the complete ask. Um, so there was a lot of buying. And initially I had the impression it was more like retail buying, but at some point there were such big tickets taken away that I thought probably some bigger people and I'm, I'm guessing that on, on Thursday, they have a webinar and everybody knows they are drilling that next hole. Would you do a webinar while you are getting very close to your target depth or would you do a webinar after you, you know, seen the visuals? I, I would expect maybe an updated news release next week, maybe a trading halt, uh, because why would you do a webinar on Thursday uh, if you are, if you did not drill that next hole yet, so I'm assuming that they may come out with more visuals before Thursday, uh, but I'm not sure. I'm just guessing. Uh, otherwise, you would do a webinar a week later, uh, I would think. But mm. it'll be interesting to see how that goes. But it, it's kind of obvious at this point too. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. What else? What else we got for me? I will just briefly highlight Veridis mining. Um, I don't know much about it. So normally I don't want to talk about these type of things, but I got an, uh, from the same Aussie that I just mentioned, uh, I'm in a, sitting in this WhatsApp group and they were talking on Tuesday about this company because they apparently have this massive alkaline intrusive in Brazil. And this is in the same area where uh, the other company with symbol MEO, uh, Meteoric Resources, uh, sitting and they made a discovery of rare earths and this stock went up. 2000% is now a 500 million or 450 million dollar company and this company acquired licenses that are apparently very interesting and they mentioned that on Tuesday already and the stock has been going up this week uh, on this news and I don't know much about it they were talking about you know uh, there's 400 million tons already in MEI and there's a potential for billions of tons of oxide here so I'm not going to talk much much more about it because I don't know what I'm talking about, but perhaps for people focused on rare earths, um, what I understood from the Aussies is that this is a really interesting place to be. And that's why the company is up um, 200%, uh, 140% this week. <clears throat> I'm soon interviewing Meteoric, so it's mm. going to be interesting to see... Um... To see what my opinion is going to be by then, yeah, but yeah. but I don't yet have an opinion. But I'm going to have a, a an opinion for him. So I'm going to be interviewing them. By the way, on the CEO Barbecue channel for people listening, this is the new channel. Um, oh, that's a good one. I think you should listen to, to it. Uh, I'm going to listen because this company is not really expensive yet. Free this. It's only a uh, twenty million dollar company, hmm. and I have no way of really saying this is cheap or this is expensive. But based on what Meteoric, Meteoric achieved and. I don't know if if Virtus also can make a discovery or has a discovery already because they announced some results. I don't know enough about real earths to 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 put any opinion, real opinion about the quality out there. But uh, for people who do know about it, I think this is interesting. Yeah. What else? What else have we got this week? Well, potentially another discovery, and this one is a very small one, and I don't think a lot of people have heard of this company. We discussed it once. Uh, 
uh, it's probably two or three months ago, I think, uh, in one of our earlier um, episodes, I mentioned it uh, very briefly, I think, uh, because last year in October, San Lorenzo, a company that almost nobody knows, and I'm not joking, almost nobody knows this company. Um, I talked to the CEO this week, and he has not been called once. I was the first person to call last year in October, and I was the first person to call this week. Nobody calls them. It's really under the radar. Last year, out of the blue, they announced a new discovery. It was a bit of a weird announcement because they announced a copper equivalent, but there was almost no copper inside that drill hole, mm. <laughs> only 0.15%, and the rest was gold. So I was surprised them not announcing it like a gold hole. Uh, 150 meters of, um, I believe, one and a half grams gold equivalent. Just check that, but that's it's pretty close, I guess. And 200, within that, that was within 200 meters of 0.8%. Uh, 0.8 grams gold. So a really long intercept. So I called them up and asked them, and they said, yeah, well, this this was an area they already had. They they acquired this land position within when it was still a lithium company. They spun it out into San Lorenzo, and uh, there's also a high-grade gold target on this same property. Uh, but now they are looking for this porphyry style. It was only one hole, and there was no interest. But I I was looking at the finance at the financials, and there was no money to drill more holes. Uh, so I talked a little bit about it with them, like how are you going to finance, and uh, I even introduced them to to, to a group, uh, but nothing happened with that. And and after three or four months, they announced a new drill campaign without a financing. So mm-hmm. I was surprised again. I mean, this company surprised me a couple of times, and apparently this, the the CEO uh, and the biggest investor, perhaps himself, or maybe with two or three other people, gave a loan to the company, and they were drilling this campaign with a complete loan. And that loan is not convertible into cheap stock. So they are really trying to keep the share structure as it is until they have proven or tested if this is a discovery. And they drilled uh, four more holes in this um, um, in this belt, 300 meters to each side. And um, they seem to be hitting some real... Uh, similar, so let's, let's put it like this. They seem to be hitting some similar mineralization like the discovery hole they are not providing a lot of detail so they are saying significant and same alteration same style but they are not saying if that same style is over the same widths uh, but i can imagine if it's over the same width and they are drilling 150 to 200 meter holes uh, with you know mineralization and alteration in it that looks similar to the discovery hole in my mind they have a 600 meter strike and in my mind they have a real dis- deposit uh, hmm. I cannot say if this deposit would be high grade or low grade, or I don't know if one and a half grams would be enough. But this is a three million dollar company, or was a three million dollar company. And I invested last year in October uh, because the stock went down on the news. Uh, earlier this year, I acquired a little bit more. Um, and on this news, when the news came out, there was just no volume, just no volume at all. And I decided, like, am I crazy or is everybody just missing this? And I decided uh, after this news release to to buy the ask and take whatever was available at six and a half and seven cents. And then suddenly it started moving on still on pretty low volume. And it was trading at 15 cents for a while. And then it dropped back to 12 cents. And that's where it ended the week. Um, I think it's still really high risk. Um, it's a small company. And that's why I think it's interesting uh, you can buy, you know, a pretty significant percentage of the company for almost nothing, and if this is a big porphyry discovery, then you know what is the upside. Hmm. Uh, so, so what is it? Is you tell me? Is the market missing this, or I mean, is the market crazy, or, or, or are you crazy? Well, the market is for sure missing it. <laughs> um, I'm sure that this is of interest to companies, and they are missing hmm. it. This is this is really really interesting. Uh, I can, but. You know, if is this going to be an economic discovery? I cannot say that. I think mm-hmm. in September, when the holes come back, they think that they will have it with Labor Day, just before or after Labor Day. Uh, is it Labor Day? Am I confusing the two U.S. holidays right now? The uh, September I holiday. think, yeah, I think, what is it? This, Yeah, I think so. I think the 7th is, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I think so. The 7th of September, at least around that time, they expect to get essays back. And that will tell the story. I mean, with these holes... Them saying that it looks similar to Discovery Hall and hopefully similar widths or more, uh, that's gonna that's gonna determine whether or not they will be financed. And the CEO told me that he is not willing to finance or not interested to finance. Let's let's put it like this, 
at six, 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 seven, eight cents type levels because that's three or four million dollars. And of course, you will dilute the company like crazy. Um, and I think if those results are similar, even if the grades are just one or one and a half grams, there's enough evidence that you want to test the system. Maybe adapt, maybe a long strike. Uh, I'm not a geologist, but I think you cannot drill five holes like this if it's similar to Discovery Hole uh, and not get any interest on the market. That's, in my opinion, impossible. And uh, so the potential is almost unlimited from a $3 million market cap. Uh, so I'm very interested. I'm also biased because I bought stock on the announcement day this week. I already owned stock from last year. Uh, but since I had some doubts about the team, they, they are not marketing at all. They are not financing at all. Um, they are difficult to reach sometimes. Uh, there's, there's no liquidity at all. I had some doubts about things. Uh, but I'm still giving the, them the benefit of the doubt because I'm impressed. Not many companies finance a drill program you know, through their main shareholder in order to not dilute the structure. Well, that is impressive to me. Um, so I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt and we'll wait for the drill results. I'm not going to sell a share until I see the essays because this could be, you know, I can sell it. I can sell my stock now at a double, uh, but this could be a 10 bagger. It could be a 50 bagger. And of it, course, I'm not, I'm not saying it will be, but I mean, it has the potential if you see holes like this. Mm. The, the, the number of shares outstanding, they've gone through some dilution since uh last year over the last 12 months as i can see they went from 48 and a half million to 63 and a half million shares outstanding so that is some dilution um how's cash right now they've probably gave out some warrants last year how many warrants do you know that no uh well they financed in 2022 so they they financed for the drill program they did uh, uh last year in 2022 so i think they financed early 2022 that's now uh, one and a half year ago that funded that program and since they got no really no love uh on this drill hole it's incredible to drill a discovery hole and the market doesn't care at all they decided to um you know the shareholders decided to give the company a loan and finance it right now there's no money in the bank literally there's 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 negative working capital because they have no money almost let me have a look at the financials um quickly so they have uh ninety thousand dollars in the bank on March 31st, and they have $300,000 liabilities. But it's in March. I mean, since then they did a they did a program, so they probably have $600,000 or more in liabilities versus $90,000 in current assets. So they are effectively broke if if it wasn't for the loan from the shareholders. So they are doing it for the right reasons. I only know one company myself who did this before, and this was Orion with Dave Lotan financed the company a bit like this in 2015 because he didn't want to dilute at five cents. And finally they did a financing at 40 cents and then at $1.50 or $1.80, I think uh, a little bit later. So not many people are willing to take a risk like this. And if they, and if people do it, they have a convertible, they, they convert their loan into five cent stock. Dave didn't do that with Orion because he wanted a share structure and a, you know, a future for the company. And this group is also not doing it right now, as they tell me, at least. Uh, they tell me they're not, they don't have any convert in it. It's just going to be a loan that will be paid back once they have financed it at a higher level, if the holes are good. So uh, for me, it's it's worth the risk. Um, on your question about warrants, I'm not sure if the warrants expired. I'm, I'm not sure if I can quickly... Uh, I, warrants are important to me. <laughs> And it's, it's a shame that I cannot answer the question like this. Um, Three million warrants are outstanding right now. And they are um, expiring. Well, they were issued in 2022. I don't see. Oh, and No, I think they expired. They expired as well. So no warrants. Interesting. Oh. <clears throat> so there's going to be less drag on the share price if it started moving up. Okay. There, there will be uh, almost no. I mean, there's always a little bit of... Uh, there's always a little bit of stock that will be, you know, if people start buying and the stock goes up, you will see stock becoming available. Right now, it seems to be as clean as it gets. Mm. Uh, yesterday, when it was buying at 12 and 15 cents, you saw some sellers coming up uh, and you will always see that, but it's very illiquid. So indeed, if the results are very meaningful, uh, it's going to move in a straight line, I think. All right. Up or down. <laughs> so if the, if the, if it's, uh, if the, if the results are good, it will be back. Uh, if the results are really not meaningful, 
I think the stock will go back to five cents. And that's the risk here. In that case, they have another project that's very interesting, uh, high-grade co- uh, gold project. But then, you know, how are they going to finance in that case? So mm. um, it's certainly a almost binary situation for the stock price in the short short term. It's either going to go up vertically up or down is my is my expectation. Good good expectation, or, or potentially it might go sideways. Um, but no, that's true. I mean, explorers live or die by the drill bit. Yep. Um, and, and this is definitely not an exception. So good stuff. Yeah. What else this week? It's rainy out. So I don't suppose you're going to tell people to go out and <laughs> so maybe tell them to be behind their computers more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, this was the news for this week. Uh, wishbone Gold, uh, is, is, I want to just briefly touch on that one. Uh, last week, we lo- we saw Wishbone Gold, an AIM-listed, London-listed company, going up on, on big volume, no news. I couldn't find anything. They were not drilling, so I was surprised. And this week, they announced an equity raise. So probably the move last week had something to do with the equity raise. Uh, now the stock is down 30% on that news, and um, that was the reason. I think it's uh, still an interesting thing to follow because they have two projects that kind of interest me. I'm not going to buy the stock until I see a real discovery. Uh, that's sort of a rule for me in London because London listed stocks are difficult for me to invest in uh, in, in several uh, ways and reasons. But um, yeah, I'm going to, I mean, they, they are raising money and they will probably drill and I'm going to follow them. But that was probably the reason it went up last week. And E N R G elements. I don't know anything about the company, but the reason they went down that much is because of the uh, Niger. Isn't, how do you exp- pronounce this country? Niger. Niger in French. Yeah. Niger in French. I don't know how, how they pronounce it in the U.S., but um, Niger. That, Niger. Yeah. I mean, the situation over there is very uh, troubling. Uh, I'm not going to try to. Uh, Find, well, I'm trying to find out what it is because it's a complex situation out there, but I'm not going to try to evaluate it in this show because I'm not updated enough about situation over there, but it's for sure not good if you have a project over there. All right. It is time for me to alleviate the pain for the people who are shaving their legs and cannot get to their phone to skip this video, which is probably being too long and just shut up. I am on talks.com pretty much Um every day, all day. So if you want to forward your questions to upcoming guests and companies, or if you just want to talk to me for some reason, if you're having marital issues, we can talk about that. Um, And, and, and of course, other people, I think there's about 300 people on there in the chat. Um, If you want to talk about how angry you are at uranium and stuff like that, please visit resourcetalks.com. Again, it is a chat platform. It's a free chat platform. And it's, it's incredibly easy, easily accessed. If you're on discord, you can also play it in this. It's just, it's good. Okay. Just go on resource. Go on resourcestocks.com because I have to eat. My wife has an expensive taste. I've said that already, and you should really do it. With all that said, I wish you a great Sunday or a great long weekend if you're in Canada. And it's a great week, a great month, and just a great life. And if you feel like wasting your time next week, I'll probably still need to eat, which means that I'll probably keep making these videos. So thank you and take care.